started the second continued education of the Veterinary Council of Nigeria. And we have uh, our professional colleagues coming from far and near. Today we, we had about, uh, about 400 physically in attendance and about 600 attending virtually. And we thank God that's a huge success. We are veterinarians and um, I am very, very happy to, on behalf of Veterinary Council, to keep the flag flying that continuing education is a mandate which we all signed onto during our inauguration, our induction into the profession that we owe a lifelong obligation to continue to learn. So anything that will stop learning has ended development, has ended growth. So that the flag is flying is very good for us. I must recognize that there was a very big pushback on several platforms against the hosting of this particular CCP or CPD because people felt uh, we were good enough with the virtual program that we've been having and we had one in July and because this particular edition is also kickstarting the use of credit points for the issuance of annual practice of practicing license, APA. We have taken all your comments into consideration, but we know that for the benefit of the profession, this is the right way to go. Veterinary Council of Nigeria, I want to say a very, um, I mean, we are very warm welcome to each and every one of us, those that are physical and those of us that are virtual, um, to the first hybrid this year, uh, continuing education. Since we came on board, this is the first time we are having physical meeting. Uh, so, once again, the protocol, uh, our very amiable, resource persons that have traveled far and near to come to Ibada. Uh, the chairman of the continuing education uh, uh, committee and his very wonderful and committed team, very resilient, I must also say. Other council members that are here, present either virtual or physical, and are very eminent uh, deep in of the UI, who is also celebrating her birthday this morning, Professor Ola Davis, the chairman of the LOC and her team that have uh, put in this very beautiful place together uh, to welcome our participants to Ibadan. When you talk about veterinary education, I think you are on the right side. So developing these skills, that's why I said we need to open our minds. Most of the time, as human beings, one of the things we see are the obstacles. Oh, the veterinary curriculum is already overbloated. We know how it is, it's bad and all that. But until we have an open mindset, we won't be able to admit to what we need to tweak. The broadening of our curricula, we need to broaden it. Our new teaching and learning strategies, addition of new curriculum content. We need to remove some to make room for the, those ones that are more important that are adaptable to the 21st century. And those are conversations we need to be ready to take with sincerity. We need to have those conversations with sincerity. I was, I was on the platform this morning, and of course, we were venting. And I talked about the fact that Nigerians, we are, we are raised to compete, not collaborate. That is one of the fundamental issues we have in Nigeria. Territoriality, one upmanship, and better than you. And we protect that, and those things prevent us from collaborating. So that's why I said I'll be as real as possible. There are some conversations we need to have uh, if we want this profession to move forward. So we need to create opportunities for inter university international study or experience. As we saw 
education is no longer in person. You can do hybrid. You can get professors from Harvard, from Stanford, to teach best students in Nigeria. It's just a matter of deploying technology. So we are only, our boundaries are only in our minds. So we need to open our minds to other opportunities. And if you don't have the opportunity in UI, why can't you collaborate with TVU? You if they have it there also now. Because at the end of, well, I had a VC say you have, which I don't know about that. <laughs> and I have a microphone, you are the best of the best, of the greatest. This is where you are. So if you don't have the facility, we need to collaborate. So all this will it require international institutional collaborations and the monthly veterinary education in its entirety. Key factors for the process of administration is regulating, conciliating, balancing compromise and providing service. But compromise in the sense that you cannot say all or not. There are mostly issues that will arise in the course of implementation. You have to bring all parties concerned and look for a middle way to resolve it. As long as it achieves the objective we set for the organization. So a good administrator should have two main skills. Personal skill and a communication skill. These are what the ingredients that are needed for a successful administration and management of any organization. It's carry out adequate, complete physical examination. Check all your peripheral lymph nodes. Check everything. You may, there may be accidental findings that may also contribute to the state of the patient. So carry out everything. Not only that, do a blood work. Please come at the days where you just depend on symptoms alone in management of patients. I know some of us are practicing in some local environment and you may say, I don't have access to this. Acquire them over time. Be able to do a blood work. Basically, you should be able to do complete blood um, hematology. Is that okay? And please mind your differential. Your hematology and your differential. And two, do your alchemical uh, kind of analysis because, listen, you must know the state of the liver. You must know the state of the kidneys. Otherwise, whatever treatment you are giving, for instance, if the patient, if the patient has a renal pathology, and you are giving drug contraindicated for a patient with renal pathology, you will kill the patient. And it isn't the disease that kills the patient, but you are the one that kills the patient. How do or how will the veterinarians remain you know, relevant even like by that year 2030 when the robotics supposedly will have uh, taken most of the profession? Because I like even you you know back and come out to say by that year, no single human being will be working in the back. The robots will take over the Thank you. Okay. No. I think basically your comments have narrowed everything down to education. So I will ask you this thing. Because if you look at it, that's where we get it right and that's where we get it wrong. So how does the VCN maintain? You've done the work, you've started the work, but we need a whole lot more. How do you streamline the curriculum of the veterinary education to make it more relevant to present times? Now how do you make sure? given the responsibility of managing your students, have the clinical side the knowledge in terms of present tense to be able to deliver to society the kind of veterinarians that they aspire for. I should be open. One of my grudge is not only about veterinarians, it's not about veterinary medicine, it's a Nigerian thing. There is no reason why we cannot bring my body to teach. What you don't have, you cannot give. And it starts from even when we are talking about curriculum, we are preparing for the industry. Those were some of the things I did as a deputy vice chancellor. Our curriculum should not be written by us alone. We should bring people from the industry and say, this is going to serve you. So if you are talking about doing things, then we need to do it. And that's why I'm talking about sincerity when we are discussing. Let me give you an example. 
If Dangote goes to business school and give an hour of lecture, I don't think there's any professor of business that has the experience that Dangote will bring to the table. But yet we insist that if you want to do a master's degree, you have a PhD. So until we start dealing with some of these mantles, and I, that's why I say it's not only about veterinary medicine. And but because we are here, we need to start talking to ourselves and telling ourselves the truth. Showed us. You said you just retracted. But did you find out the cause of that intuition? You should have told us. And to the glory of God, my ancestors were also watching out for me. <laughs> 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 and I became a celebrity in town. The, 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 chairman, the chairman paid my, my allowance. That was when we started MSS allowance. He paid my allowance. He said, You are doing more than the medical doctor. I will approve your allowance. And he did. But it was immediately. If I had, you know, became a doctor and I was, you know, doing all this, the man would have shown me paper. Because we had an engineer, because the, 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 the chairman thought engineers were supposed to fix cars. And they had abandoned vehicles within the local government. So he brought a copper that was a mechanical engineer to serve. And they took him and said, go and fix the vehicles, and he couldn't. And when we are going up and down, going at Chicken Gary, they'll be calling the man, engineer. And we didn't know it was engine soup. Mia is soup in Alta. They were mocking him and we didn't know and he would be waving. <laughs> because Thank you to you all to say that uh, with the lectures starting today, we know that we have a way forward, that these kids are going to finish their course. It's, it's a shame we've had to wait so long. To, uh, eight months is a long time. So you need encouragement, but the students also need encouragement. So I want to plead with each lecturer, please encourage your students. Some of them have lost faith in the system. Some of them have lost faith even in their courses. So it's now left to us to encourage them. Some of them don't even want to come back. So for those who have come back, we will need to ask them to encourage their mates to come back and finish their courses. Because the last thing you want is people who start a course and never finish. So it's just a short visit just to say thank you for coming. Thank you for starting lectures today. We're very grateful. And the VC sent me, he actually you know, chased me out of the office to say, go and greet them, go and greet them. Thank you very much. It's something that I designed myself. It tries to explain in summary how a design of a farm should be when you want to handle your biosecurity issues easily. Where you have a lot of people coming to the farm, as soon as they get into the farm, they turn right, and everything they need to do is there. The administration, people to talk to, everybody is there. From that point, you walk out. The moment you take your first turn to the left, you are going into the operational area. And the first thing you are going to encounter there is a feed meal. Then after is the feed storage. So you have no business going into the farm proper. And inside the farm, there are plots. Each plot will contain the number of big, big houses you want to contain. Then that arrow going up at that end is the incinerator. And then at this end, near the car park, is the processing plant. So that the moment you get your product, they are leaving the farm. They come out to the car park, and they're taken out of the farm. So if you're just coming to buy pork, you have no business going into the production area. The thing to do that, what we will do is to try to attempt to uh, design what I call the perfect dairy cow, okay? The perfect dairy cow that can give you the maximum production. And now, like I said, I'm going to be biased. I'm going to talk about the exotic cow mostly, okay? So. The designing the perfect dairy cow or dairy farm will have to start from the design of the farm itself. A lot of times farmers um, and dairy producers call the vets in at the tail end, just when they started suffering diseases. But we should start with farm location, design and the infrastructure in place. These are all important if you need to get this production to 60 liters or 40 liters of milk per cow per day. A good environment, of course, is equal to high production. 
protection from the elements, rain, and so on, and everything. But above all, nutrition and management. Next slide. We are still designing the perfect car. Now, a lot of dairy farms do not even have protection against the elements. Every dairy cow will need protection against adverse weather conditions from heat to cold to um, direct sunshine and the rest. Next change. This is another important challenge in equine practice. Horses, like other mammals, react badly to extreme of weather. So horses should be sheltered from extreme weather shifts. And um, some Argentine horses imported to Nigeria, especially in Lagos, they are kept under, in fact, they sit with farm inside the stable so that they can cool down. And so they wet them with cold water to check the temperature to avoid heat stroke. Another problem we have in equine practice is quackery. Quackery. This is a very serious and common challenge in equine practice. Some grooms, stable boys, and animal handlers, because of their confidence in equine handling and restraint, parade themselves as equine practitioners. They charge less, abuse drugs, inflict septic trauma, and cause death of equine patients. I think we have made noise sometimes ago. If government, you know, is ready to buy over, either the animal that are sick or dead, the dead or sick animal will not find its way to market. Is there a compensation or a buying over? Because like you said, in Ethiopia that you, you mentioned, even Kenya, the buy over animal that are sick so that it doesn't go back to the uh, to the market. So just to um, make some comment. Um, I was part of a team that uh, investigated or uh, did surveillance on uh, pig, uh, even African swine fever in New York City. And uh, we discovered that um, some of these pigs that are infected and were dying, because uh, from what we learned, government doesn't comp has not been compensating them. So for that reason, as uh, those um, farmers, as they are losing their animals, or they notice that the uh, animal that is showing signs, they decide to sell them, they just sell them off to people who consume them. My question is on the diagnosis. On many locations where we are invited to farms to investigate uh, disease conditions like this, when we take samples, we send it to NBRI. It takes for like forever before we get the report back. Sometimes the farmer must have even closed the farm. And maybe by the time the farmer struggle to restock again, or maybe the neighbor has a similar case, the farmers is discouraged to even report such conditions because in the first case, he never got a result. Or if there was any result, he came very late. So I don't know what MBRI is doing about this. In my village and even my state capital, people just start their pig with their poultry. Anytime, anywhere. Nobody comes to, to, to tell them that you need permission, you need this is not the appropriate place, or this is where you shouldn't do it. Nobody does that. If I just feel like starting a piggly now, I just build one. I don't care whether my neighbor has pigs. I can go and just buy infected pigs from somewhere and come and stop and start an outbreak. You know? And moreover, some places you even see, see the pigs roaming the streets, eating from West Dumps, being your brother's keeper in markets. I don't think that is going to happen here. So. Everybody is struggling to sell his own pig. And, <laughs> and even the market authorities, you know, I think that if all stakeholders are involved in the control of this disease, we should be able to get rid of it. I do want to thank everybody for this session. Thank you very much. I want to believe that you have enjoyed this session. And I want to thank you so much also for this, uh, attending this CE. I want to believe that you've got value for your money. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming, and God bless you. Oh, the next one, next year, you'll come again and again. Thank you. We want to thank also the CE committee. Thank you also. <laughs> thank you so much. We are so, 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 so pleased to have you. God bless you. 
and we wish you a safe trip as you go back home. It is high time veterinarians started to know that our field is not just dogs, cats, elephants, but then we are also involved in aquatic and wildlife medicine. And that's why this workshop or this uh, continuing education is all encompassing. We have the wildlife section, we have the you know, aquatic section, we have the public health section, and we have uh, the uh, equine section. So it is your choice. You actually attend what is your choice. And this is a unique one because this is the first time that this present council is organizing a physical continuing education. The participants should just go and do likewise. They have gone through so many training today and I believe value has been added to them. So they should just go into their field, everybody going back to their workplace and applying what we have learned today. And we know they can never remain the same. Veterinary practice is a profession. You know, we are doctors of animals of all types and doctors of human beings in another way. Because what we do in public health, for instance, is uh, to know fully well that most diseases in human beings to the extent of 75% are traceable to the sources in animals. So if you take care of animals and make sure they are healthy and good enough, and if you also make sure that animal products are safe for you, wholesome to eat by man, most of the diseases in man do not occur. So we contribute very well to a healthy population that is required for the development of the country. Uh, this is the GCM organized continuing education. And according to international best practices, it is expected that every professional undergo continuing education annually to update their knowledge and skills. And so as veterinarians, the Veterinary Council of Nigeria is organizing this and we do it twice a year to give people opportunity to those who need to post and partake in the second year. And without which, currently, they will not be able to register new the annual policy. As an administrator, it is true effective administration that you could be able to generate policies that will now be accepted by government to develop the industry. But for you to be an effective administrator, there are two basic policy uh, skills you need to acquire. One is the personal skill, such as you have to be active. You have to be modest. Not too much. You equally have to have foresight and good sense of judgment and have the ability to conciliate, be reconciliatory and compromise an issue, issue to be able to and be service yielding because there are contending issues for government and so if you are, have an issue that conciliatory attitude and compromise attitude will make you reach a consensus that will advance the objective. The approach should be uh, multi-sectorial and uh, multiple approach to improving dairy production. Uh, you know that most of our milk comes from uh, the top house that are being kept by pastoralists around Nigeria and the own most of the cars we actually have in Nigeria. But uh, if we have to drive this number down, uh, then we have to be innovative and create new ways. And one of the ways is that we have to have uh, advanced dairy farms. Uh, by advanced I mean farms that have cows that will produce 40 liters and above of milk per cow per day. Uh, the exotic breeds of cows are one of the solutions. I'm not saying we should discard the local cows, we shouldn't, but uh, we should uh, bring in exotic cows, do the artificial insemination, and improve the genetic makeup of our local cows. But also, we should train local farmers on uh, modern dairy farming and better management. Because even with the local cows, instead of having the two liters per cow per day, uh, with good management, we can drive these numbers up.
is very possible. We're talking of equine, equine means it's an adjective word that is derived from the word equus, and that is relating or affecting horse and other members of the horse family, including donkeys and zebra. The government in, uh, with uh, FAO had organized a workshop two years ago to get uh, farmers, big farmers, together to let them know about the disease and ways to improve the impact of the disease and how to prevent uh, pigs from getting the infection. Um, and uh, anytime there's an opportunity, we teach our students in school how to manage the disease, how to control the disease when they are infected, they are practicing the virus vaccine. And now that the veterinary council also uh, organizing this continuing education, and the disease like a migrant swine fever has also surfaced, it is an opportunity bring our graduates together who are already practicing to become more aware of the disease and methods that we need to adopt in order to control it and uh, prevent the uh, things uh, uh, coming ahead. Right now there is Fishery Society of Nigeria. Cattle uh, Society of Nigeria. There are so many other proliferating uh, societies dealing with agriculture, but they are mostly at the mass media level. Sometimes this mass media organization will filter down to educate me. More literate the use of mass media. Yes, learn more about the aquaculture farming trees benefits. The ways to start uh, wildlife advocacy, if I may use the word, is actually to improve the undergraduate. Uh, what we have currently in most of the vet schools, we have uh, we have wildlife medicine being combined with fish medicine, like in the Federal University of Agriculture, where I, where I work. Part of all the lectures in my graduate, but it is not work. That's the, that's the foundation, that's the base. So, more work to learn to seminars like these workshops, advanced training, and they cannot learn it all. You know? It's not something that domestic animals will have, they are enough to. It take you more than six years, so we wouldn't overboard in them. Well, it surely is an emerging specialty that we need to capitalize. I don't know the importance of agriculture, you understand, in the growth, in the economy of this country. I will tell you that an average serious vet doctor, a young average, average can never go hungry, except he's a lazy time. I'm telling you the truth because you can just pick your bag and you feed syringes and go into the street and talk to persons, go to farms, and you get yourself at least you get yourself being fed. Because once you are once you are moving, you understand. Once you are moving, go ahead. Once you are strong, so you can do more. So as I don't, I see this profession as very. When people are talking about unemployment, and I'm very really blessed to not be talking about unemployment. I know that you want the money to come much so that you can do many things. But it's where you start, gradually in the foundation. You will start by planting and you expect it to grow. Over time, you will get there. Well, from uh, what we have seen so far, I think uh, the council is actually meeting to expectation. Because uh, prior to uh, graduation, some of us never knew that uh, there was this kind of uh, activity for the body outside the, the school. And right now we are beginning to see it. Okay. Uh, the Veterinary Council bringing us together, giving us continuous education. Okay. After the school, we come out to interact with our colleagues, old friends, senior colleagues, and we learn more things. And uh, it completes new things that are coming up as the 
climate and everything is changing. So we are changing and we are seeing new things. So from everything, especially sure we are having here, uh, we are done with it. Very good. And it's, it's, it's a continuing education. It's supposed to be a refresher course. Some things you know, some things you don't know. Some things you know that you've forgotten. They are bringing it to your memory. And it's so very, very good. Yeah, because of this. Uh, continuing education as a resource person in the world. Maybe from my background, I'm so looking to be a country expert. So I, my talk today was on the management of a country intestinal tract, devoid of much use of uh, conventional drugs. Lead us to you know, reducing the, what we call the antibiotic resistance. When you use more of drugs, it cause some problems for the animal through eating animal food. Right? That is the aspect. Telling people how they can manage the intestinal tract of chicken so that they will use less drugs.